My Pali name is Tony Surabiku. Um, people know me as Ajahn. Jeff, Ajahn is a Thai word for teacher, and Jeff is my given name. Tony Surabiku was the name I was given when I ordained. We're here at Metta Monastery. We've been here now for 26 years. Ours is a monastery in the Theravada tradition uh, of Buddhism. And in the Theravada, for the monks, the monastery means a place where they can gain training. It's an apprenticeship. We have very few apprenticeships left in, in this world, where you're learning a skill not only in the words and in a particular manual skill, but there's also a, you know, the skills of meditation. And beyond the techniques of meditation, there are the values that you pick up simply being with someone who's been trained. There's a code of discipline called the Vinaya, which the monks live by. And it's written down in the books, but a lot of the Vinaya is something you pick up from your teacher, kind of in a day-to-day -day interaction. You begin to see how the teacher responds to this particular situation, that particular situation, how the teacher looks at you and you know, sees things in you that need to be improved and that you might not have seen if you were just looking at yourself. And so for the monks, it's an opportunity for an apprenticeship. For the lay people who come and visit and help around the monastery, it's an opportunity to live around people who've had that kind of apprenticeship so they can pick up the values. In particular, the, the relationship between the monks and the lay people can be explained as an economy of gifts. I mean, everything is done voluntarily. There, nothing is charged of anybody. We don't charge an admission fee. We, we don't charge for the teachings. Uh, we don't put the screws on people saying that they have to you know, give X amount of money. Everything is totally voluntary. I mean, the whole monastery, the land on, that we're on, the, the buildings we use, everything was given. And it's good to live in an atmosphere like that, because then the, then the Dharma or the, the teachings of the Buddha can be shared as a gift, rather than as a, as a commodity. And so for the lay people who can't live at the monastery, it's a place where they can step out of society for a while. And you know our society has places an awful lot of value on monetary wealth and, and things in general. And here's an opportunity to see that you know, the values of the mind as being the bottom line, rather than just something shut it off to the side which, that you put in the, in the corners of your life. This is something that they're brought front and center. I found as a monk that I'm not running away from the world. I've met people I never would have met otherwise, because people do come to the monastery. It's not a cloister. We're not walled off from the world. Uh, Buddhist monastics are supposed to have an interaction. I mean, if you're going to eat, you have to go for alms, and you can't keep food overnight, which means that if you're going to eat that day, you have to have some interaction with people that day. So there's a constant interaction with people. And there's an awful lot of emphasis placed on going to solitude, but it's kind of like learning how to be a good musician. You have to go off and practice for a while on your own before you can have something of value to offer to other people. You get to know your mind, you get to know the ins and outs of your mind, so that when people come with their problems, you you can see, okay, I've had that problem too. This is how I was able to deal with it. And I had the time and the, and the focus to deal with it well. So you end up having a lot more to offer than you would otherwise. For most people, the main drawback is they can't handle it. You know, they're used to having their time filled up with all kinds of activities. And when you're first thrown into solitude, you suddenly find yourself feeling kind of empty. But, and the monastic life is designed so you're not totally in solitude. I and mean, people can go crazy when they're off on their own. To get into a line of thought that just kind of becomes a, a feedback loop that um, can nourish, it, nourish itself in a very un, unhealthy way. So there has to be some contact with the community, which as I say, you have the apprenticeship. You're, if you're a new monk, you're supposed to be with your teacher for at least five years. And in some cases more, depending on, on the receptivity and sensitivity of the, of the student. So you have time to pick up the teacher's values and gain a sense of how to deal with the mind and you know, issues that come up. Um, we're in the forest tradition. It was founded by a monk who had a lot of psychic powers and things coming in his meditation. And if you're on your own and you don't have a good guide to how to deal with these things, they can make you go crazy. You start seeing visions and you start believing them, um, especially if they come and they present themselves as heavenly beings or something with a special message. You start thinking that you're special and that you've got special contacts. And there's no guarantee that what comes into your mind like that way is going to be reliable. And so you have to have ways of testing it to see if this information, first you have to sort of filter out all the extraneous stuff and see what is the information that's being offered by this piece of knowledge. 
And to what extent is it actually reliable? You put it to the test. And you don't confirm that it's reliable or not until you've seen what are the short-term and the long-term results of putting that particular teaching into, t into the test. So it's good to have a, a tradition where people have been doing this for many, many generations. There's a kind of a, a body of knowledge and a body of standards that have developed over time. Um, this is something especially lacking in America. Years back I was reading the book Into the Wild about a young man who was pretty much fed up with his society as a whole. And he was basically having to reinvent the Dharma wheel on his own. He had no idea of where to go to for advice on how to live an authentic life. Whereas the, the monastic tradition, I think, offers that in many generations of experience of how you do that. And don't put yourself into physical danger, which is what happened to him. And also he, he got pretty strange toward the end of his life and his, his attitudes. And so you want to have a, a tradition that keeps you from going strange. What was the, the example of my teacher? I, I had been looking for a, originally I was simply looking for someone who would teach me how to meditate. And I was in Thailand at the time. I had a fellowship to teach at Chiang Mai University. And I was looking around for a teacher. Finally found one that I found really inspiring. It was much more inspiring than I anticipated, just in terms of the way he conducted himself and the wisdom with which he treated the problems that I had and the compassion he had. And he kept saying that whatever wisdom he had was nothing innate in him. It was something that came from the training. And I realized that that was a training that I wanted to have. Well, we've had a lot of non-Buddhists coming up here. Um, because there's a lot in training the mind that has nothing to do with whether you're Buddhist or not. And the main topic of meditation, for instance, is the breath. And the breath isn't Buddhist, it's not Christian, it's not Muslim, it's common property all over the world. And so when you try to get your mind in the breath, you find particular issues coming up that are very you know, again, the issues are not Buddhist. You find that you're suffering around something or that um, something's interfering with your ability to stay concentrated. And we can give advice on that. And when you're developing qualities like mindfulness and alertness, discernment, they can help you in what, with whatever background you're coming from and whatever activities you've got. Well, don't be put off by the robes and don't be put off by the shaven heads. I mean, the robes and the shaven heads have their reasons. We shave our heads so we don't get lice. And we have robes because they're a very convenient form of clothing. I mean, you can do all kinds of things with robes that you can't do with a pair of pants or a shirt. You can make a tent out of them. You can make a blanket out of them. You can put all your things in them and carry them over your shoulder. Um, and so everything here has a purpose. And if you can actually sit and talk with the people in the monastery, you begin to see the values of a, of a community where, as I say, everything is based on gifts. Everything is given freely. There's not an exchange that so you have to give this in order to get that. I mean, you come and you, you give of yourself and you find that you know, the people are happy to give of themselves. So there's a lot, to, a lot of benefit for, I think, for anybody who would want to come to the monastery is really looking for a, a solution to the problem of why is it they are suffering from things in life. And as the Buddha said at the beginning of wisdom is when you have the question, okay, what when I do it will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness, and what will lead to my long-term suffering? Because you see it's that your actions that are the problem. It will make the difference between happiness and suffering. And also that long-term is better than short-term. And when you want to look at long-term, it's a matter of taking your, your happiness seriously. I mean, most of us, when we think about what kind of happy life could we live, we look around and we see people who are wealthy, or people who are beautiful, or people who are powerful, and think, well, they must be happy. And we're not looking very carefully. And you have to look more carefully and to see, well, who out there really is happy? And how do they do that? I mean, happiness is something that's very valuable for us, and yet we treat it as if it's you know, of secondary importance. No, I don't think so, because the Buddha himself encouraged people to take their happiness seriously. It was simply a matter of learning how to do it right. Um, and, and part of it has to do with how you conceive your happiness. And secondly is, in his own pursuit of happiness, as he said, the wisdom begins with what will lead to long-term welfare and happiness. You begin to realize that if your happiness depends on other people's suffering, it's not going to last. So one of the prerequisites for finding genuine happiness is learning compassion for other people as well. And then finally, the quality of purity is looking at your actions. Do they really lead to happiness? Are they really harmless to yourself and really harmless to other people? And so there, right there you've got the quality of wisdom, compassion, and purity which were the qualities of the Buddha himself. 
And they come from you know, taking the question of your happiness seriously. Not in a grim way, but in a sense of being really earnest and trying to figure out, well, what is genuine happiness? How is it best found? <laughs>